Thanks for tuning in to the final week of our parable series here at City Church. We are honored and blessed to have you join us for our online worship experience. It is our intent to share God's word with our community, our church family, and online viewers like you. If you're from the greater Savannah area and don't have a church home, we would love for you to visit us at 1624 East 38th Street on the corner of 38th and B Road. And remember, resources like this are meant to be supplemental, so get yourself to church. If you like what you see today, you can visit us at citychurch.life or just click on the link in the description. Today's message is uh, 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 the fourth in our series of parables, uh, and we are looking at some of the teachings of Jesus. Uh, specifically today, we're looking at the, the story of the faithful servant. So we're going to be in Luke chapter 12 for the majority of our text. Uh, there are a, a number of parables that take place in this particular uh, chapter. And those different parables, uh, they all deal with uh, different, I, I would say, uh, lifestyles. Uh, you have hypocrisy, uh, covetousness, worry. Uh, you have these different uh, types of, uh, of emotional, I guess, uh, places that people end up, right? And, and how many of you know people who, who get caught up in these places, right? They get caught up, somebody who becomes, a, they, they really get caught up in, 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 in their own uh, self-righteousness. That's what leads us to hypocrisy, right? Is that we begin to, we acknowledge a standard, but somehow we justify ourselves as being exempt from that standard or that the standard applies differently to us. Do you guys know that, that hypocrisy has birthed a number of religions around the world? Like this, is, this, this type of living has huge consequences uh, on people. Uh, covetousness, that is, you know, longing for what somebody else has, longing to be able to have the same as somebody, and even worry. Uh, there are people who allow their entire lives to be consumed with worry about what is happening around them. And in these parables, Jesus addresses them, and, and he says that there's a common solution. There's a common uh, like fix for all of these, and, and that is to have an anticipation for the future. That if we can have an anticipation for the future, uh, and, I'll, and we'll get into exactly what that means looking at the, the faithful servant, then, then it's going to help us as we navigate our, the way that we live our lives, right? Uh, it's going to help us as we navigate uh, uh, our, our interactions with the people around us. So uh, I'm going to back up just a little bit here in Luke 12 and, and verse 29. And he says, and do not seek what you are to eat and what you are to drink, nor be worried. And so we're just taking a look at this idea of worry. And this is really a, a great passage because it says, for all the nations of the world seek after these things, and your father knows that you need them. And so here Jesus, talking about this idea of worry, he says that everybody is worrying about the types of things that you worry about, right? Right? The thing that is different is that our Father knows that we need them. And I just, I just want to begin this kind of like looking into the faithful servant with this premise being established uh, for us that, that when we are walking through it, God is not surprised and you're not the first one. Like whatever it is, whether it is a lack of resources or a lack of relationship or you're being attacked, whatever it is, even if it is by your own doing, it's not like God sitting there going, whoa, I didn't see this one coming. How in the world did this happen? And, and, and we forget that, right? We forget that when we're walking through it and we begin to think like, how did I get here? God, did you forget me? Has anybody ever prayed that prayer before? Like, God, where are you, right? And, and, and when we, if we look at that practically, that becomes kind of a, a silly prayer. It's the God of all creation, the God that is uh, omnipotent and omnipresent. He's everywhere at all times, all knowing. We, we would declare these things until it's our situation. And then we would go, God, did you forget me? I'm over here in this little hole. Where's God? He forgot me. And it's, and it's not that way, right? Because it's not the type of father that God is. 
Uh, this is one of the things that I, I always uh, tell my kids because, you know, kids go through like this natural phase in life of just like there's a worry that they're going to be uh, abandoned or that you're going to forget them or they're going to be left. And I don't know what births that, but any time that those emotions kind of rear their heads with any of our kids, we're always like, hey, has daddy ever forgotten you, right? Has daddy ever dropped the ball? Has daddy ever abandoned you, right? And, and I get it. Like sometimes, uh, you know, parents walk out the door, get in the car, and they crank the car, and they start making their way down. I mean, if, if that didn't happen, we wouldn't have home alone. You know what I'm saying? Uh, but the truth is that long term, it's not like there's this real forgetfulness that takes place. At, at some moment, the, the oh, you know, it, it's there. God doesn't even operate like that because God is with us at all times. His attention is not divided. My attention is divided. Sometimes, in fact, uh, we were riding down the road yesterday coming back from Birmingham, Alabama, and uh, everybody was asking me a question at the same time. God is just able to just, you know, he's able to answer all those questions. I had to make everybody in the car be completely quiet. I couldn't handle it. And on top of that, an, an unnamed individual was doing this to me, right? And I'm like, ah! But that's not how God operates. So here's the problem is that we declare that God is one way, but when it comes to a difficult moment, we act like God is like us. We pray like God is like us. Hey, God, I'm here to remind you, just a little helpful nudge, just a, just a little sweet little reminder that I'm over here and I need you to do this. And, and that's not the way that God operates because God knows and this isn't the first time that one of his children has walked through a difficult situation. Amen? And so for, for, no matter what you're walking through right now, no matter what you're feeling, even in here right now in this place, God's not like in shock. God's with you. He, he's in support. He's here for you. And so Jesus, he says, he says you need to remember this. This is a, a premise that's set in place. And the reason that he sets it in place is because there's a call for us to be different. You and I are not to be like the rest of the world. We're not to sit there like the rest of the world trying to figure it all out and worrying about where it's gonna come from because if God is God and God is king and God is on the throne, then God is not surprised, right? And we take our needs to the Lord. We ask God to intervene, but we do so, what? With confidence. We go to the throne room with confidence because he's a good father. He's a responding father. And he doesn't, he's not, he's not waiting around on us to come and just, hey, God, in case you didn't know. And so we have to think differently. We have to talk differently. And this is what Jesus segues into uh, in, in, the, in the remainder of our time is he jumps into how it is that we can be different. What is different? And, and, the, and the, the way that he does this is, is he addresses different from within the body. He doesn't just exclusively come in and go be different from the world. What we're going to look at right now in the faithful servant is, is, is something that is applicable to even being different from the people that you might be sitting next to. Now, the goal is in sharing this parable is that everybody that is sitting here today would get this, that they would be hungry for him, that they would be different from the world. But the truth is that when it comes to being a faithful servant, there is even those who come to church on Sunday and they show up to special events that they themselves are not grasping the fullness of what this looks like. And so the faithful servant... Luke chapter 12, verse 35, he begins by saying, stay dressed for action and keep your lamps burning. Uh, we'll just jump right into this. Uh, this idea of staying dressed for action is being ready to run. What does that look like? Remember a couple of weeks ago, I shared the story of the prodigal son and that it was very common for the men, especially men of influence within their community to wear long robes and those robes were cumbersome. And so when it was time to run, what they had to do was they had to grab that, that, that robe down low. They had to pull it up so that there was some freedom to move in their legs so that they could take off and run. 
And so the people who are reading this, this is their interpretation, is that the idea of being dressed for action means that I am literally in a place where I can react, I can move. So the first, the first part of this parable that, that Jesus is going to dive into is he says it is important that we are ready to do something, that we are ready to move. So as children of God, as servants in this world, the idea that, well, I just don't know what to say when it comes to sharing the gospel is a red flag that I need to figure out what to say in sharing the gospel. Because if I am not able to share the gospel, if I am not able to share who God is and what he has done, I am not ready for action. And so God might send somebody my way so that the gospel can be presented so that their life could be transformed. And who knows how many family members might come to know Jesus. And if I'm not ready to be the voice, if I'm not ready to make a move, then shame on me. And it talks about having this light that's burning, this lamp, it's ready to be seen. The story of the 10 virgins, another parable that Jesus tells it's the story of these 10 virgins. They go out, they have their lamps, they have oil, and they are waiting on the bridegroom. And uh, late in the night, the bridegroom has not come. He's later than what they thought he was going to be. And five of them are running out of oil. And they turn to the other five who had prepared for a long night. And they said, can we borrow some of your oil? And you know what they had to say? They had to say, listen, I... I can't do this, I can't give you any because what if we end up being short? And so those five left, they went, they got more oil and when they came back, the bridegroom had come. So it's really important that we kindle the fire. Listen to what I'm saying, that we kindle the fire inside of us in such a way that our testimony is not, I got saved when I was six, but our testimony is I got saved when I was six and let me tell you what Jesus has done since then. Let me tell you what God has been at work doing through my life. What is your testimony? That's where we're gonna be able to measure how much light you're producing. And I'm gonna be honest, if you're at a place right now where you're like, I don't even really know what's going on. Like, I just feel like things are good between me and God. And you're not engaging the world around you throughout the week. Can I tell you, you're probably running low on oil and you might wanna address that now. When I was uh, in college in Springfield, Missouri, I uh, was working at a, a long distance carrier uh, called MCI. I don't know if any of you guys remember that back in the day. And so I had the honor of going through school, uh, calling random people and trying to convince them to purchase long distance from, from us. And, and uh, some of you might not understand what that is. I was sharing the story with my kids and they didn't know what long distance was tried to explain to them that, you know, we used to only get so many minutes on our cell phone in a month and that if we called long distance, we had to pay extra per minute and that there was a time where we didn't even have cell phones. Uh, and in fact, we were watching a movie one day and this lady answers the phone and she had one of those little curly long cords coming off it. And Ezra is like, what is that thing attached to, to the phone? Like, why is it there? And uh, we were trying to explain to her that they didn't have them wireless. It had to be hardwired. And he said, well, why is it so long? Because it was one of those that was like 20 feet long. And it was, you know, my grandmother used to walk the entire house. Like she could clean on the phone with that giant cord, right? And then she would use it until it just lost its like tension, right? And then it was time to buy a new cord. And so uh, that was my thing. I, I worked at MCI and uh, I had this guy that worked there with me and I, uh, he was uh, the type of person that I didn't really uh, get along with. I'm not going to lie. I don't know how to explain that. Uh, there's just people that you meet that you're like, oh, good, you're here, right? You ever met one of those people? And he was one of those people. And I was at church on a Wednesday night and I was praying and I just, I'm, I'm not going to lie to you. Like I, I, I'm really slow to get up and said, Hey, God told me this. Hey, God told me that because I think we water that down so much. Like, like, you know, I, I shared a few weeks ago, but it's like, you know, what color shirt I'm wearing. God was engaged in the process, you know, and then people think that's weird. And then when God's speaking, they don't know how to listen because they're weirded out by 
by the fact that we don't take responsibility for our actions. Instead, we just make everything God's fault, you know. But then there are times where God actually shows up and speaks. And so I just, I heard God speak so clearly to go and share the gospel with this young man. And I, no lie, told God no. And I said, there's no way I'm going to do this. I don't like him. Please send somebody else. And so I went home that night and I told Carmen what had happened. I said, I was praying. And all of a sudden, I just heard the voice of God and told me to go. And I was like, not happening, God. I love you. And you know what I said? This isn't a Jonah situation, right, God? I'm not being like Jonah. I'm just saying there's somebody better. Thank you. Amen. And I didn't sleep at all that night. And so I laid there all night long, unable to sleep, and in this tossing and turning moment with God. And so the next day I go to work, I'm exhausted, and I uh, don't share the gospel with this guy. And that night I come home, and I am now I'm just like, you know, I've been up for, you know, 36 hours. And my wife, in her amazing wisdom, uh, who is actually here today, she's working in kids, and thank you to all of those who take rotations and serve there. Uh, she's back there today. She, she, we were getting in bed that night, and she just said, you know, Jim, maybe you should just do what you believe God's asking you to do. And uh, maybe, uh, maybe then you'll get some sleep. So I, I'm, not, I'm just being honest with you so you can see some humanity here. I was like, fine. I'll do it tomorrow, God. So I fell asleep. I woke up. I got to work early. I was really nervous, and I was sitting there, and I was like, I don't even know what to share story-wise with this guy. And God told me to share the story of the ten virgins with him. And I said, God, he doesn't even know what a virgin is, right? How is he going to be able to follow me in this story? And uh, I, very trying to be obedient, I go inside, I sit down, and I'm not, this isn't my normal cup of tea. I don't just walk up and do this to people. Uh, I invited him to go on break and and share a break with me, and he told me no. And uh, I was like, all right, God, I tried. And I was reading the book uh, uh, from the series, the Left Behind series back in the day, right? (laughs) And there's a, there's a foreword in the book that talks about if you're reading this book and, you know, portions of the population are gone, here's what happened. Well, I'm sitting here reading the book and he comes and I'm on a call and I can't get up because I'm tethered to the thing. And he walks up and takes the book like the type of guy I expect him to be uh, out of my hand and is like, I can't do anything about it and walks away. I'm very annoyed. Uh, I'm on the call trying to sell long distance so that I can pay for school and eat and, you know, all those things that go with that. Just remember that when somebody's calling you. And I, uh, or I wasn't, I guess they, now they just scam you. Anyway, that's a whole other story. So I, I just said, uh, I got done and I was like, hey, dude, uh, can I get my book back? And he just had this like look of, like he had just died. Uh, and he said, the, the beginning of this book, is this true? And I was like, well, I mean, that's an interpretation of Scripture, but, you know, some hold to the fact that it'll be like that. And he said, I need you to tell me about this. No lie. And I was like, okay. And I was like, you want to go grab break? And he was like, yes. And so we went in there, and I told him about that, and then I was praying, and I felt like God told me to come and, and share this with him. And so I shared the story of the ten virgins, and he just began to weep and cry. And he said, that's me. He talked about getting saved as a young person and how that he just had no fire in him. And he began to talk about like just his own faith experience and how that because in essence that oil was had faded because he had lost that. There was no fire. And so he just kind of existed. And then he found no value in church and in Christian community. And so now he tells me he's selling drugs and partying all the time. And I'm like, this is way more information than I signed up for. You know, I don't know what to, what to say. And I said, Can, will you repent? And, 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 and I walked him through the whole process. And he told me, no, I won't do that. And he got up and walked away. And I, I just, just, just to give you a picture, over the course of the next six months, uh, I'm constantly trying to invite him to things, invite him to the church experience, invite him to events. He won't come. There's a concert at our church. I invite him to come. He says, fine, I'll come. I'll meet you there. And so we're in this service. 
and the worship is going and the band comes out and they're singing and at the end the pastor comes out and says here right now what I want everybody to do is I want you to look at the person sitting next to you and I want you to ask them do you know Jesus and if you are not living for him can I go with you down to the altar so that you can set your life right and I was like oh I already know the answer to this and I looked over and he just started bawling and I was like dude what's wrong and he was like, I'm just, I'm ashamed. I'm embarrassed. And I was, what are you ashamed of? And he said, I got here early before the concert. And I was like, oh, well, you walked in after. And he was like, yes, because I was in my car getting high so that I could make it through this church service. I, I, can I just tell you all something? Can we just get real for a moment? So when you go home at night, I, I don't know anything about drugs. I've never done drugs. It's just not my testimony. The first time I've ever seen weed was last year, right? And I had somebody in the church who was like, had gotten like really redeemed in their life and wanted to be set free. And I had to go and dispose of it. And I did see the video where the news reporter was at a place where they were burning the weed and he is like tripping all over the place. So I knew better than to light it. You know what I'm saying? Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I threw it on the ground and thought it was smart. I took the, the guy's bourbon and drowned it in bourbon and was like, done, I, ha, and I walked away. And everybody's telling me like, no, you dry that out and you get like a bourbon flavored marijuana thing going. I don't know. My point is this, I just don't know. So if you're sitting there going, man, Jim, Jim, yeah, Jim doesn't know. I don't have a perspective, right? So when he tells me he sells drugs, I don't know. And I don't know what it means to get high in your car before you come in. And I know there are people who do, and I love people who have walked through that. I'm just not that guy. It doesn't make me better than anybody else. It just means my mom and dad didn't let me go out on Friday night. I had to stay home and watch it. Watch Urkel, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, got, you get what you got. This is, who, this is me, right? So he tells me this, and I'm like, I don't, I don't, okay. Like, I'm sorry that you did that. And he's like, but this was actually good. I could have done this not high. And I was like, well, you can do Jesus not high, right? I mean, these are the types of lines I come up with, just so you know, right? It's what goes on a T-shirt. And he's, so he's crying. I'm like, let's go, let's do this. He's like, no, I'm not ready to give all this up. It's like, I don't know what to do. A couple of weeks later, we're at work, and he says, hey, I heard your church is doing a, has an event uh, Friday night. I want to go. And I was like, I don't know what that is, right? So I called Carmen, and she was like, yeah, Bible Man is coming. If you don't know what Bible Man is, Bible Man is a dude who wears purple tights and pretends to be like some type of crossover between Luke Skywalker and Thanos. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Um, and, uh, and they do Bible scripture and they fight the devil bad guy. And I was like, Hey, this is for kids, bro. This isn't for us. And, and he, he legitimately told me, he said, uh, well, if, if you won't take me, I'm going by myself. And I was like, no dude, I'll take you. And so I called Carmen and I said, we're going to go see Bible man Friday night with, uh, my friend. And she said, well, we'll look kind of weird. Uh, we didn't have any kids at the time. So she started calling her friends who had kids and we took a bunch of kids. Like we had a daycare bus that we pulled up in so that we didn't feel like we were out of place. And we sat there and in the middle of the program, true story, in the middle of the program, the guy stops and he pulls his mask off. Kids are like <gasps> crying and stuff. And he's like, I've never done this before, but I feel like God is speaking and God is telling me there's somebody in here. And he just begins to read this guy's mail. Like, like telling this guy's story right there. And he says, and God wants to set you free right now. And I'm like looking at him, I'm like, oh, oh my goodness, like this is it. Like he's going to get saved at Bible, man. <laughs> it's going to be crazy. I'm thinking about the story and he's crying. And I look over and I'm like, dude, that's you. He goes, I know. Shh, shh. I'm like, God knows it's you. You're not going to shush God. And he's like, no, leave me alone. And he's like, Ugh. like looking at the floor like he's Ugh. And he didn't do it. He didn't accept Christ in that room that day. And so uh, I was like, we left. And uh, as we were leaving, I was like, listen, you've actually never come to an actual church service. You've come to these two special events. Why don't you come to church on Sunday? And he's like, I'll call you tomorrow and let you know, right? And he left and uh, he didn't call Saturday. I went to bed Saturday night just feeling really defeated in the whole process. And I was like, God, I was obedient. You said, do this. And here we are. This is, nothing's happening we're just constantly in this game. 
And uh, I went to bed sad that night. I don't know, you ever go to bed sad? You ever just go to bed, bed feeling like, man, this isn't what I signed up for, right? I hate those nights. And this was one of those nights. And my phone rang really early on Sunday morning, seven o'clock. I know it's not early for some of you, but that's like the break of dawn for me. And uh, it was him. And he said, he said, hey, uh, I want to go to church this morning. That woke me up. And so I'm running around the house, Carmen and I both trying to get ready because we want to go to the earlier service at the church we were attending. And we go by and we pick him up. And, and I'm, I'm just going to tell you, like, like, he comes out in khakis and a white shirt. And the khakis are like three inches too short. You can tell he just doesn't. He, he's dressing up the best that he can for what he has. He thinks this is what you wear. And, he, and it just is like, you know, I can see his white socks and his shoes. And I'm like, okay, bro, we're doing this. Like, we're going to church together. And so we're sitting, we're driving down the road. He's in the back seat, and he's just like sitting, looking out the window. I had an old Cutlass Supreme at the time. Anybody know what that is? It's an old car. Um, and uh, we're riding down the road. He's looking out the window, and it just, I just got this feeling. It was like a kid, like, like, like anticipation, like when are we going to get there? And so I asked him, I said, hey, what's going on? And he said, uh, he said, Friday night after we left Bible Man, uh, I went out with my, with my friends and we went partying. And I got there uh, and I don't remember much, he said, but Saturday morning I woke up in a field with nothing on, laying on a blanket next to my girlfriend. And I felt so empty inside. And he said, I realized I had had more fun and felt more complete in a room full of kids at church than I did partying out here with all these people. And so um, I left. We were supposed to be there all day yesterday, and I went home, and he said I was just, I just went in and sat down, and I just, I had nothing to do, and I just had this hurt inside of me, and he said that uh, he decided to watch a movie. And so he went and knocked on the neighbor's door in his apartment and asked if he could borrow a movie. They evidently had a large library of videos um, and knocked on the door. And so he said that he got this movie called Homeward Bound. Anybody ever seen the movie, like, with the dogs and the cat? And uh, you, you, it's, it's a good movie. Uh, and so uh, he's watching the movie. It's about these three pets who get separated from their family and they find their way home. And so he's watching the movie, and he's all by himself, and he said he heard an audible voice say, it's time to come home, son. And he's freaked out and paused the movie, and he thought that the neighbors were messing with him, and he said he tore the house apart looking under the bed, went into his roommate's room, like nobody's in there, and he thought, whatever, went and sat down, turned it back on, movie's going, and he hears an audible voice again and said, son, I'm calling you home. And he paused it and did this again. Nobody's in there. And on the third time, he just began to weep. And he went and found a Bible and he started reading. And he said he fell asleep reading the Bible and woke up this morning and was like, I just want to go to church. Can I tell you, at church that morning, he gave his heart to the Lord. And, and, and following that service, I went back to his apartment with him and he cleaned his life out. We went through with trash bags as he just emptied every. Thing that would hinder his relationship with God into those bags and said, get it out of here. My life needs to be changed and transformed. Can, 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 I, just, can I just tell you that today that, that if you don't have oil in your lamp to be a light, you have no idea who around you won't see. And it really matters. And Jesus begins this whole story with this concept Peter's going to ask in a moment, who are you talking to with this parable? Are you doing this for all the lost people or are you sharing this story for us? Because I think Peter's listening to this going, man, maybe this is for the believer. Maybe it's those who believe who are showing up waiting on the bridegroom. I mean, because if you think about it, why would the non-believer show up if they don't think the bridegroom's coming anyway? No, it's the person who has some measure of faith, but they aren't willing to do the work to get the reserves in place to have a fire in their heart until the time that he shows up. Verse 36, and be like men who are waiting for their master to come home from the wedding feast so that they may open the door to him at once when he comes and knocks. And so he immediately talks about this idea of being in the place to receive the master and this idea of waiting. I, this, is, this is a 
major issue for us. Because I can't tell you how many people that I have met who would say, God did this in my life. I believe that God has a call on my life. I believe that God is real. And they, they get so impatient that they just stop waiting. And because God didn't show up after 30 seconds of speaking to me, I just don't know that he's real, becomes the declaration. Or me and God have things figured out. Or it'll be all good. It'll be okay. And the truth is, that's not, that's not how it works. And so if, if you're the believer in the situation, the idea of being the servant means that you are waiting, that you are the one who is in holding for when the master returns. Verse 37, blessed are those servants whom the master finds awake when he comes. Truly I say to you, he will dress himself for service and have them recline at the table and he will come and serve them. It's this really odd statement that the servant is served. Jesus modeled this just before he goes to the cross when he comes into the group of disciples at that final meal and he begins to wash their feet. And they're like, what are you doing? No, you're Jesus, you're not to do this. And he says, no, I am showing you a better way. I am here to serve you. This is, this is the picture that he's painting is that in those moments of waiting where it feels like you just need to give up, that if you'll push through, God will come and do the heavy lifting. He'll come and he'll do the hard things that you're wrestling with as long as you're ready for action and as long as you've got oil in the lamp. He'll make a way. If he comes in the second watch or in the third and finds them awake, blessed are the servants. So guys, there's a blessing for waiting. We should not look at the, the seasons in our lives where we feel like God's not doing anything as these big negatives, right? There is, uh, I heard this term this last week. There, we talk about an ROI when we talk about business or return on investment. And we don't ever use that when we're using church language because it sounds so businessy. And so one of the guys was like, well, we'll call it an E-ROI, the eternal return on investment. And there's an eternal return on investment that takes place in your own life when you learn how to just be patient and wait. God, you said you were gonna do it and it hasn't happened today, but that's okay because you're God and you do what you say you're going to do. You see, our destiny, the thing that we're called to, the place that we're called to step into, that, 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 that truth, that reality that's there, we can sabotage that. We can sabotage the thing that God wants to do in our lives by running, becoming impatient, and failing and falling into sin and being disconnected from God. We can sabotage the destiny. And if we would, instead of being impatient, go, you know what? All that's happening right now is I'm storing up blessing. It's gonna be even better than I thought it was gonna be because I'm in the period of waiting. He uses this word here too, and it says, and he finds them awake. And, and it reminded me of some passages in Revelation chapter three, uh, the church at Sardis is being addressed. And I, I wanna look at this briefly, uh, beginning in verse one. Uh, he's talking to this church and he says, I know your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. This is how, 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 how the angel of the Lord is giving a word of caution to believers. So this is people who are showing up at church. This is you and I. And then, so maybe this, is, maybe this is you, right, specifically. And it says, I know your works, right? These are the things that you do, your works, you have the reputation of being alive, but you are dead. So reputations don't save. Your reputation is not going to provide an eternal benefit for you. I read stories all the time of celebrities, right? They get pulled over by the cops and then the cops are saying that, that when they pull the celebrity over, the celebrity is like, do you know who I am, right? It almost seems like it's something out of a movie. Like, like, who would actually do that? But people actually try to leverage their reputation against expectation. Your reputation does not exempt you 
from expectation. And so you don't get to go, hey, listen, do you know who I am? Because you might have a reputation of being a really good person, but you might actually not be. And he says, you have a reputation. The world around you thinks that you're alive, but I'm here to tell you that you're not actually alive, right? Wake up and strengthen what remains and is about to die, for I have not found your works complete in the sight of my God. And so he's using this language of works here in verse one. He uses it again in verse two. And, and then we love to go, well, you know, like I'm not saved by works, like the things I do, that, the scripture says that, that is very true because the things you do don't save you. They are a result of you being saved. They are the fruit of the fact that you're saved. And what are those works? Those works are sharing the gospel. Those works, Jesus said, here's what I want you to do. Here's your task. It's really simple. I want you to go into the world and teach them all that I've taught you. Right? Feed the hungry. Shelter those who need sheltering. Tell your coworkers and your family about Jesus and live it out every single day in every single way. If there's an opportunity to pray for the sick, pray for the sick. If there's an opportunity to believe for restoration, believe for restoration. Model this stuff out all the time. Those are the works that he's talking about. And when we're saved, it is just an overflow of who I am. It's not the thing that saves me. And so the writer here is saying that God is looking at the church and going, your works aren't complete. You're, you're not bearing the fruit that you should be bearing. Why is that? I'll go back to verse one. It's because you have a reputation of being alive, but you're dead. Remember then what you received and heard. Keep it and repent. If you will not wake up, I will come like a thief and you will not know at what hour I will come against you. Wake up. It's the same thing here with the servant. He says, if you're asleep and I show up, you're gonna miss out. You see, part of the waiting process is this conscious alertness that it hasn't happened yet. And so he tells them, you need to wake up. You need to stop living in this idea that maybe it's not gonna happen or maybe I'm exempt. He says, wake up. In verse four, I wanted to add this in here because it's really, it's really applicable. It says that you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments and they will walk with me in white for they are worthy. This is what it says. It's that just because like in a situation like this, I get up and I'm sharing scripture. This doesn't mean that everybody who's sitting in here that has a reputation for being alive is dead. He says, some of you are. And there are those of you who get this. There are those of you who share the gospel and you love Jesus everywhere you go. And so we want to make sure that you are also aware of this caution because we don't want you to fall asleep. But the really strong language that's used here is those who have fallen asleep, those who have just kind of locked themselves into this like lifestyle of not really serving the world around them, the language that's used, the description is, these are people who have soiled their garments, right? And the cleansing of that comes when I begin to be a person who is serving. And so some are awake, but many are asleep and have the appearance of death. And in essence, they bring death to the people around them. So let's go back to Luke 12 as we wrap up here in verse 39. But know this, that if the master of the house had known at what hour the thief was coming, he would not have left his house to be broken into. Listen, if I were to tell you tonight that there's a thief coming and they're gonna break into your house and they're gonna steal your most valuable possession, you are not just gonna go home and open up the windows and open up the doors and just go to sleep and let them come in and hurt you and steal your stuff, you're gonna go home and you're gonna make preparations. Some of you are gonna go home and defend your home yourself, right? Because you live in the South. Some of you are gonna go home and you're gonna call the cops and make sure the cops know and you're gonna go get a hotel room and hope that they do their job. But none of you are just gonna give up your most valuable possession to a thief, and he says that if you knew that it was happening tonight, every one of you would be living like you were alive. But the problem is you don't know when Jesus is coming back. 
You don't know when he's going to show up. And because of that, you think to yourself, what's one more night? It's like going on a diet, isn't it? Right? It's like, I need to go on a diet. I'm going to start that tomorrow. And then tomorrow, it's like, I need to go on a diet. I'm going to start that tomorrow. And then Thanksgiving comes, and I need to go on a diet. I'm going to start that in January. Right? And then January comes, and we start it for like three days. And then it's like, there's still some leftover pound cake in the fridge. This is it. This is natural. This is natural. What he's saying is you have to be intentional. You can't go natural. You can't just go like, hey, this is comfortable. This is, this is you know, hey, I'll get you. No, you've got to go, no, I need discipline in my life. I need the fruit of the Spirit to be evident because I need to be doing the Father's work because he could show up tonight. He could return tomorrow. You also must be ready for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. Come on, think of, that's exciting. When I get up and say that Jesus is soon returning, people will get excited, right? People will stand, they will clap, they will hoop, they will holler. It's exciting to think about the fact that Jesus is coming back. But it's not meant to excite us It's meant to call us out to be faithful servants. The parable isn't so that you get all hyped up that Jesus is coming back and look at me, look at what's gonna happen. I'm gonna be with Jesus. Instead of saying he's gonna be here in 12 hours, let's get ready for the party. It should be he's gonna be here in 12 hours. I need to make sure that the house is ready because there are rooms that are not ready. There are people that don't know him. I need to make sure that the other people around me are in a position where they're ready to receive, where they're ready for the master. The excitement shouldn't be in what it comes for me, but it should be a sense of, God, wait just a little bit longer. My mom and dad, my brother, my sister, my coworker, that neighbor of mine, I've been laboring and praying and I think they're on the verge. It could happen any moment. They, they're so close. God, just, just wait another day because I understand the consequences if you come and they don't know you. So how do we do this? How, how can you and I be the faithful servant? I think there's, there's four things we can do. The first thing is, We've got to love God in in everything. Like God has got to be our greatest love. It's got to be the conversation piece that we lead with in our lives. We cannot be embarrassed to share the gospel. Can I tell you, it is really difficult for me when people ask me out in the world what I do for a living. Sometimes it's hard to say I'm a pastor because immediately people shut down. And it's not because there's a flaw in the character of Christ. It's because there's a flaw in Christians. It's, because, it's not because Christ is a hypocrite. It's because Christians are hypocrites. And so they measure the, 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 the potential of the gospel against the way that people who claim to be Christians act. And so when I share that I'm a pastor, it is not uncommon for me to get, oh, I don't believe in God as a response But can I tell you something? I'm not exempt from telling people about Jesus and neither are you. And it is not, we have said this from day one at City Church, it is not my responsibility to share the gospel in this community. It is my my responsibility to share the gospel, to invest in you because you are the workers in the field. And where you're sharing the gospel is places I cannot go. John Maxwell, I heard him this last week, he said that, that right now they're saying that 53% of Americans will not step through the doors of a church. That means that 53% of the population will only hear about Jesus if you're talking about him. If you can figure out how to be the ones sharing the gospel. We need to love people. Can I tell you that God loves people and if we love God, we're gonna love people? 
We've got to figure out how it is that we can begin to be interacting with people. And can I tell you another thing? Like if you've got junk in your life that's preventing you from loving God and loving people, figure that junk out. It's not eternal. You're not gonna be standing there for eternity mad at your friend. You're not gonna sit there for eternity in disappointment at a family member or a coworker. So figure it out. Figure out how to love the people that you're struggling to love because that light is a really bright light. When the people around you begin to go, whoa, 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 I thought you guys hated each other. You've reconciled? Why would you do that? How could you do that? Oh, because I love God and God's at work. And I believe that God's in the process and the business of restoring and not just other people, but he's in the business of restoring me and the people I care about. Pursue excellence. We gotta stop playing games with this. The world around us, they, there, there are so many people that think the church is a joke because of the hypocrisy that Christians operate in. We have got to rise above that. We need to put our very best into the gospel. We need to put our very best into Jesus. And this is not, be really easy to, to, to even kind of push that into some financial thing. Do you know what it does? It takes money to pay the bills and to do things. But do you know what? It takes people loving people with all of their hearts for the gospel to be spread. And we are here to evangelize and win people to Jesus. We're in, a, we're, in a, we're in a new building. We've been in this building for a little over a year. We've been sitting here and preaching and working at this thing. And we have a, a good core group right here. I don't want the testimony of the next five years to be, hey, this church grew because we figured out how to get Christians to leave their churches and come over here. I want the testimony to be that people who were lost came to know Jesus. And the only way that that's gonna happen is if you start sharing the gospel and you believe in what's happening around you and then choose joy. This is something I've been on our team about. It takes a lot more effort, we know from, a, from the scientific method to frown and be angry than it does to smile. In fact, we were talking about it this morning and somebody said it takes four times the energy Four times the amount of energy is exerted when you frown than when you smile. And some of you are walking around like, I'm so tired, I'm so defeated. And it's because you're wasting all your time and energy being angry at the world, stuck up and stubborn about something. And there's this big problem. And some of you bring that here to the church. Can I tell you, when we pursue excellence and choose joy, we don't bring problems, we bring solutions. And the world around us needs that. Your workplaces need that. People don't go to the comedy club so they can cry. They go so that they can laugh, right? Why? Because people enjoy happiness. And they want to be around people who are happy. And you can't write it off as my personality. God, I just, my personality type, you made me this way. Like, I just am not ever happy. God's going to say, no, I did not give you that spirit. You took that on on your own. You bought into that identity. I gave you joy. That's what I gave you. Let's stand to our feet. I want to end by asking this question. What's next? What's next? So you're in here today and you're doing it. You've got it figured out. You love Jesus. You're somebody who shares the gospel. You're that depiction in Revelations chapter 3, verse 4 of somebody whose robes are white. You're doing it. You're doing good. What's next? How are you going to know Jesus better tomorrow? What are your next steps? If you're in here today and you don't know Jesus, what's next in your life? If you're in here today and, and you're like, man, I know exactly what he's talking about. That fire that I used to have. I definitely know it's, it's not quite where it used to be. My life is filled with compromise and excuses and there's just things I don't want to give up. What's next? Answer that question for a moment. What's next? What am I going to do? What's the next thing I'm going to do 
when it comes to Jesus. Do I need to restore a relationship? Do I need to lay down my pride, my ego, my vanity? Do I need to make some things right with family members? Do I need to be a better worker? You know, have I lost the excitement of for working at my job? So now instead of going and putting everything I've got into it, I'm sneaking around listening to podcasts as much as I can or, or uh, uh, you know, showing up late and leaving early and trying to milk the situation for as much as I can. I can't answer that for you. You're the one that knows that. I was talking with my brother this week and he was telling me that just a few months ago, he just found himself in that place where he was just discouraged and he was just had his phone out all the time, listening to podcasts and looking for opportunities to be disconnected. And, and, and just in a short period, he was like, I don't want to be that guy. I want to be the guy that puts everything into it. He's not doing the job that he, that he loves. He's not in a place that he's passionate about, but he doesn't believe he'll get into a place that he's passionate about if he doesn't put forth his best right now because he believes God's gonna order his steps. Is that you? What are your next steps? You see, being the servant means and being awake means I'm active. I'm ready to run. I'm ready to do something. I want us to right now just bow our heads and close our eyes across this place today. And I wanna give those in here who do not know Jesus, those who are online watching right now, and if you do not know Jesus, the first step, the first step is acknowledging that you need Jesus to be Lord of your life. If that's you in this place today, I want you to pray with me right now. We wanna pray this prayer and we just simply say, Jesus, come into my life transform me fill my heart with joy give me purpose and I am committed to be in pursuit of you because I need you in my life I need you You're my only hope my only salvation my only way If that was you and you prayed that prayer, we would love to know that. In a moment, we will have prayer ministry teams at the back. You can go back there, share with them that you've rededicated your life or you've given your heart to Jesus today. We wanna to celebrate with you. If that's you and you've done that online, you can email us. We wanna be a part of the next steps because it's more than just accepting Jesus. There's more than just that one moment. We have to begin to bear fruit. We want to be in that conversation with you so please let us know now with heads bowed and eyes closed if you're in the room today and you you have a little concern in hearing the message that 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 maybe there are areas in your life that are dead maybe there are areas in your life where you are not faithfully serving and you want to respond to that today you want to respond to that that, that, that area of your life that is, is dead and you want to wake it up, then I, I want you to pray this prayer with me right now. Jesus, I am surrendered to you. I surrender the areas in my life that are dead, that are asleep. Wake them up. Give me life. Give me purpose. Have your way. Transform my life. that today you really have to walk out of here thinking what's next because if you don't start asking what are my next steps what's the next thing I'm doing in my kingdom life you're going to stay where you're at you need to start thinking about where you're going and again we'd love to be a part of that conversation with you and let's just take a moment as we close and let's pray Jesus we want to be a part of reaping the harvest we know that people matter to you that people are your business help us to be the evangelists and the ones that are sharing the gospel so that lives would be transformed souls would be saved use us let our light be powerful in this world we love you and we praise you in your mighty name amen and amen guys let's take a moment and let's just sing Sing this again.